favor, Marta. Por favor. I'm, I'm gonna call you. Oh. I'm gonna call you. One by one, okay? Don't worry, I won't forget you. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Eduardo Green. I'm a professor at Chaturro Vargas Foundation here in Sao Paulo. I would like to you all to sit down. We're going to start this, this seminar, this international seminar. And firstly, I would like to say on behalf of organizing committee, that it's a great pleasure for us to receive all of you in our country, especially in our institution. And warm welcome to this international seminar, Federalism and Democracy in an Era of Emergencies. And especially warm greetings to our international colleagues and Brazilian colleagues to accept, for accepting this invitation to participate as a speakers in this event. Thank you so much, especially for our international and Brazilian colleagues for your availability and willingness to participate in this seminar as speakers. And especially to our international colleagues, welcome to Brazil. Uh, it's a great honor to receive you. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have all of you to discuss federalism in Jews today and today and tomorrow. And also for sure, thank you for the, for the audience in participating in this seminar both in person or also in online way. Um, well, this event was born uh, maybe six, seven months ago, and this one is smaller idea, but this project uh, grew up and we, we were able to improve the capacity to organize. It's just a big event, at, at least I think this is a big event. And considering the initial proposal, do the support of six entities whose representatives will be part of these opening tables. So from now, I will call one by one in order to compose this table. But firstly, I would like to invite my colleague, Rogério Schlegel from the University of Sao Paulo. Please, Rogério. Dear colleague, also responsible for organizing this event. And <coughs> without, without uh, the, the lack of his support, for sure, I want able to organize this big event at Lonely. So thank you, Rogério, for, for your help and your support. And from now, I will call one by one, starting uh, from our Vice Dean, Professor Thales Andreassi. Um, Thales Andreassi is uh, our Vice Dean of South School in Sao Paulo. And Dan Rodrigues Levy, representing Federal University of Sao Paulo. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Thales. And Murilo Kominski, Brazilian diplomat, special advisor at the Secretariat of Institutional Relations of the Presidents and Representative of Brazil at the Executive Board of the Forum of Federations. Thank you. Please have a seat. There is no fixed place. And Rupak Shadopai, Shadopadai. <laughs> And I trained him before. <laughs> Rupak Chatopadai. Rupak is the president of Forum of Federations. Thank you, Rupak, for your support. And Johanna Schnabel, representative of the Freie University from Berlin. Professor Ricardo Gomes. Professor Ricardo Gomes is the coordinator of our graduation course in public administration and government at Chaturro Vargas Foundation here in Sao Paulo. Um, I think the table is, is complete. So thank you very much for your support and, and making this seminar a reality. And special thanks also to FGV Research and Publication, especially to the professor uh, Thomas Wood uh, for the grant that you receive in order to organize this seminar. And finally, our acknowledgement to FAPESP, Sao Paulo Research Foundation, uh, the state agency that also supports this event. So from now, we are going to start the, this is, I would say, brief speech, starting from Professor Talis. Once again, thank you so much for your participation. Professor Talis, the word is yours. Okay, hello everyone. Good morning and welcome to FGV ASP, the School of Management in Sao Paulo. The mission of FGV, the Vargas Foundation, is to contribute to the development of Brazil uh, and promoting a seminar about federalism and democracy is totally aligned to this mission, especially in a young democracy as the Brazilian democracy. 
Uh, in relation to our school, FGVISP, uh, one of our strategic guidelines is the internationalization of the school. And I strongly believe, and I strongly believe that this seminar, in partnership with Fair University and UFSP, is contributing to this guideline. Uh, I would like to thank some institutions and people that help in the organization of this event. University of Frey, here represented by Johanna Schnabel. UNIFESP, uh, we are uh, here, here represented by Dan Levy. Um, Professor Eduardo Green from FGVASP and Rogério Schlegel from UNIFESP, thank you for your Korean job. I have already organized international <coughs> seminars some years ago, I know, and I know that it was really a tough work. FAPESP and FGV Pesquisa for their financial support. Forum das Federações, here represented by Rupak Chatudapai. Brazilian government, here represented by Murilo Komniski. I wish all of you an excellent event. Thank you very much for your participation. Now, Dan representing Federal University of Sao Paulo. The word is yours, Dan. Good morning, hello everybody. My name is Dan Levy. I'm chief of office at the Federal University of Sao Paulo, UNIFESP, and I'm representing Professor Rayane Assunção, our dean. Uh, I'm so glad to be here at this important seminar in the name of Professor Rogério Sulego. I would like to say hello to everyone, especially to our, um, especially to Murilo Kominski, represents our Minister of International Relationships, uh, Alexandre Padilha, the Dean of Fundação Getúlio Vargas, Thales Andreassi, and the President of the Forum of Federations, Mr. Rupak. I'm professor uh, at the University of São Paulo, Univers Federal University of São Paulo, Paulist, Paulist School of Politics, Economics, and Business. Um, UNIFESP has its root in 1933 as a private medical school. In 1956, it became a federal institution, turning to, into a federal university in 1994. UNIFESP has seven campuses and it's considered one of the most important education and research institutions in Brazil. It aims at promoting the country's social, economic, and technological development through inseparable activities in teaching, research, and extension. One of our values and goals is democracy, transparency, and equity. We are the first best federal university in Brazil in 2023, according to KIAS World University ranks. So the theme of this, of this event, federalism and democracy in the age of emergence, is a great opportunity to argue new forms of democracy. This political regime can survive without science, research, and education. So we need to keep assuring our commitment to scientific learning that respects and develops popular knowledge, traditional knowledge, in search of decolonial education through a non eurocentric polysemic, diverse, and inclusive epistemology, capable to strengthen our democracy and the role of science in the new time of the world. Therefore, in Brazil, federal universities should have an important role in the age of emergencies. We needed to highlight that discussion is very important to the fortress of democracy especially before the threats of the ultra-right around the world over the last few years. For this reason, our university is willing to celebrate agreements and partnerships that stimulate research and studies in this scene. Finally, I would like to say thank you very much for the invitation and congratulations of the, on this seminar. Have a nice event. Thank you, Dan. And now, Murilo Kominski representing the federal government of Brazil. Good morning, good morning, everyone. A warm uh, welcome and uh, thankfulness uh, for uh, your presence here, especially saluting the initiative and this uh, joint, uh, this joint uh, cooperation between uh, the Getulio Vargas Foundation, the University of Sao Paulo, the Federal University of Sao Paulo, and the Freie Universität uh, of Berlin. Uh, in the name of uh, President Lula and Minister Alexandre Padilla, we deem this event of great importance. I would like uh, to give a warm welcome to my colleague uh, Rupak, who is uh, sharing uh, with me 
this uh, great challenge, even though he has a long time uh, in this endeavor. I'm a newcomer, so to speak, uh, in the, at the board, uh, being a member uh, at the board of, of the, um, the Forum of Federations and having Rupak as CEO of, uh, of the Forum of Federations here present with us is a, is a great demonstration of this uh, relaunching of the cooperation between the government of Brazil, the federal government of Brazil, and the Forum of Federations, and also uh, a relaunching of our relationship with the academic uh, representatives, which we deem of uh, enormous importance. This seminar, uh, as uh, I was mentioning before we started this seminar, uh, is of great importance for Brazil, for the federal government, and uh, specifically for the Secretariat of Institutional Relations uh, in, uh, uh, at the federal government, at the presidency. Uh, not only for the, the three main uh, uh, issues of the seminar, which is uh, at the forefront of uh, debates at the academic level, uh, at the uh, private sector, uh, at, uh, within uh, social, civil society as a whole, within uh, social movements and within the, the political environment, which is uh, federalism, democracy, and emergencies, uh, in the sense that it is exactly during emergencies that the democratic institutions of uh, all our countries uh, are very much tested. Uh, and we are happy to having been going through uh, major tests uh, in the last uh, in the last few years, uh, namely the last major test that the democratic institutions of Brazil had to face, the last eighth uh, of January, uh, that you you all followed uh, uh, in the news. Uh, we we deem this uh, gathering at the academic level and also bringing together representatives uh, of the of governments. Uh, and civil society of great importance in a way of uh, establishing, reinforcing the think tank mode of, uh, of, uh, of our dialogue. But also I would go even beyond, I would say a think do tank uh, approach. And that's, uh, that's also one of the adjectives that I've been using being a member of the board of the Forum of Federations that, and also the two main councils that we are establishing uh, at the level of the presidency, the Council on Economic, Social, and Sustainable Development, and the Council uh, of Federations, which is under the responsibility of the Secretariat of the Presidency as well, and of our ministry, the Secretariat for Institutional Relations. And uh, also we have two uh, great uh, members of our team uh, at the Secretariat, Eleni and Andre, who has been uh, who have been working quite uh, heavily in the establishment of this new uh, Council of Federations, uh, which will have both, and I, I, I like to mention both of these councils because they come together in a way, uh, having the same, um, the same objective being the establishment of dialogue, the openness of dialogue within institutional uh, representatives, but also not only dialogue and uh, think tank mode, but also a do tank in the sense that it is a space we deem the Council of Federations as the Council on Economic, Social, and Sustainable Development as uh, the Forum of Federations uh, under the CEO, uh, the excellent work as a, of Rupak as CEO of the, of the Forum of Federations as a space that we can also come together uh, produce knowledge, but also establish proposals, concrete proposals for the federal government to move to move ahead. So this gathering that we are having here, and I once again would like to thank, uh, especially the leadership of the of the Tugu Vargas Foundation of, Pro of Professor Green, uh, in uh, in uh, establishing this uh, this dialogue uh, in this uh, next uh, next uh, days. Uh, not and we do believe that. Uh, it is, I would not say a first step because uh, you guys have been, have, been di have been establishing academic dialogue, uh, many of you know each other, but I would say that in this spirit of relaunching 
the uh, engagement of the federal government of Brazil uh, within civil society, within the academic level, in all diversity of Brazilian society, not only internally but also abroad uh, with uh, international partners, we believe that this is going to be a very important step. That uh, will be not only food for thought in the establishment of the Council, but it will also enable us to maintain close dialogue and close cooperation with all of you. So uh, once again, I would like to, to thank you. Uh, we believe uh, that we are still facing great challenges uh, in the country, great institutional challenges. We are moving forward uh, 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 quite uh, rapidly. Uh, I would say that in the last uh, six months, as President Lula mentioned uh, lately, we relaunched all public policies which were the mark of uh, public policies, uh, not only of his government and uh, President Dilma's government, but also previous, uh, uh, previous uh, uh, offices uh, which were uh, focusing on important issues such as health, education, um, social inclusion. Needless to say, as a career diplomat, of course, I will have to, to mention our foreign policy, which, it has, which has been regained as a very important asset of, uh, of Brazil, of, of us all. So in a word, I would say that uh, Brazil is back. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and I would say, as we have this uh, Build Back Better uh, uh, slogan, but I, as, as uh, the Brazilian slogan, the Brazilian government slogan as uh, reconstruction and union, uh, I would say, and I normally say within my team members and uh, with uh, Minister Padilha and also with President Lula, it's a moment of reconstruction and moving ahead. So in the last uh, six months, we reconstructed quite, uh, I mean, all positive public policies uh, that uh, were marks of uh, the Brazilian government. And we are uh, hopefully moving ahead uh, quite fast as well. Uh, you may see that uh, I haven't been having much uh, time to sleep. Uh, so it's, uh, it's quite a uh, workload. Uh, 20, I would say, not 24 hours, but 20 hours of work, uh, that's for sure. Sometimes uh, with two, three, four dinners uh, in the same, uh, the same evening. Uh, but it's, and, it's a, and it's a great privilege being part. I'm sure that Andrea and Eleni who are maybe more used to the, to the academic perspective and to the academic approach, uh, I normally try to balance both I, I'm also a visiting uh, professor here at this uh, university at, uh, at the, of the uh, Getulio Vargas Foundation and some other universities uh, around the world. I try to balance my academic perspective and my uh, uh, public servant day-to-day uh, -day, uh, activities, and it's a completely different, it's quite enriching to, to, to have the academic perspective, the strategic long-term perspective and see how this is to be put into practice. Uh, but I would say, so, and it's of course, I, I, I do believe that Andre and Eleni agree uh, with me that it's a great privilege being part of this uh, process, of this uh, moment, this historic moment of Brazil that we are regaining our public policies, we are regaining positive space uh, in the world, we are regaining positive environment, we have some some way to go still, but we are regaining public uh, uh, positive environment of a dialogue of institutional relations, of uh, public political respect uh, going across the aisle and uh, establishing dialogue and bridge building with all uh, levels of Brazilian society. Uh, and uh, this works as well uh, in our international affairs, uh, uh, of course. So it's, once again, it's, uh, we, we do believe that this seminar will bring us very important uh, uh, um, proposals, very important ideas, and we do count on us on continuing this, uh, this dialogue and this cooperation. Thank you, thank you all very much, and let's have a great seminar. Thank you, Murilo. And now I will call the president of Honor Foundation, who Pak Shatopadai. Now I mentioned correctly your last name. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. My family name was complicated.
<laughs> thank you, Hopak, once again. Uh, first, uh, thank you, Eduardo, for the invitation. And I'm very delighted that the uh, Shutilio Vargas Foundation and the University of Sao Paulo have put this event together. I think this is very, very important. And for the forum, it's a privilege to collaborate with both institutions. But equally, it is a, for us a privilege to again be re-engaged with the federal government, the Ministry of Institutional Affairs in Brazil to work on something that is really, really concrete uh, going forward. Uh, as I'll say later this afternoon, um, uh, you know, thanks to COVID, I think there's been a bit of a renaissance in thinking about intergovernmental relations. And I think there is a, um, there's a revival for the need uh, for better, for institutionalizing better the way in which, inst in, uh, in, in, in which uh, intergovernmental relations is, is managed around the world. And for the forum whose uh, main mission is to act as a platform <coughs> for sharing international experiences amongst federal countries, it really is rewarding for us to be engaged with Murillo, uh, Eleni and Andreas and the, and, the, and the federal government here to work on this very, very important initiative, something that was left half done uh, early on. And, you know, we've, we've been working on this, uh, this idea of creating a federation, a council for the federation uh, for close to 20 years in various uh, forms. And to see this now coming into its own and being established is indeed rewarding for those of us uh, who have supported these initiatives o over the years. And uh, you know, I'll be I'll be brief because I'm going to speak again later this afternoon. Uh, and 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 a seminar like this is a great opportunity to learn from uh, academics and experts from all around the world. Uh, and uh, you know, as much as this benefits Brazil, it also benefits uh, the forum for, for us to collect. Uh, different perspectives on these issues and I look forward to learning but uh, in addition to the learning it's also a great opportunity to reconnect with uh, with friends uh, Marta Reche who I've uh, worked with off and on for the last 20 years Alan Senna uh, Murilo of course more recently but we have very close collaboration and and to to be new uh, to make new friends and acquaintances like uh, Eduardo uh, so I, I really look forward to the rest of the the event thank you very much for convening this and uh, I look forward to the discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hupak. Thank you once again for the support. And now, Johanna Schnabel, representative of the Freie Universität of Berlin. The word is your, Johanna. Yeah, it is my very great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Eduardo Grin and Rogerio Schneek. <laughs> for putting together uh, this fantastic event. And um, what's particularly nice is that there's a bit of a background story to all this that very much highlights the importance of cooperation and, and networking. Um, I know Rogerio and Eduardo from very completely different situations, one facilitated by Joel Mendoza from Mexico, and what started as a very general idea that is after the uh, IPSA conference in Buenos Aires, it would be nice to organize a seminar in Brazil to bring international colleagues to Brazil for, for exchange and networking, now has actually turned into a proper event. And I think that's very, very nice to see. And I'm very pleased to, to be here. And I'm very pleased that you allowed me to bring international colleagues to Brazil to talk about Brazilian federalism, to talk about uh, other federations. And I think this shows how important it is to have exchange um, between different continents, between different countries, not to just talk about federalism in Europe, talk about federalism in North America, talk about federalism in, in Australia um, and in, in Latin America, but to actually cross continents to learn from each other's experiences, insights, and also to cross disciplines to talk to yeah, exchange between academics, practitioners. So I can only highlight what Rupak just said, and I look very forward to this event. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. And now, finally, Professor Ricardo Gomez, coordinator of our graduation course in public administration and government. Please, Ricardo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all of you who come this long distance, live in your summer holidays to stay with us in our winter holidays, to live in a cold Sao Paulo. It's a pleasure <coughs> for us to have you, all of you here. You know, Brazil is a large federal a country who have 26 states, more than 5,500 municipalities, a huge disparity 
uh, among them and we want to learn from you why you, we can uh, use this uh, knowledge in to improve our country no good i have a representative from the brazilian government because you know here is some space to learn uh, we want to learn from you what you want to uh, teach us about uh, uh, federalism and how to improve democracy in this very difficult uh, moment to uh, just finish a uh, uh, pandemic and now starting uh, the <coughs> new normal as you will say no as i said this is a space to learn and we want to learn from you in this time and thank you again for getting together the event and and uh, the all the people involved in this in this process and we are here to learn thank you very much thank you ricardo thank you thank you all for your kind words in this opening ceremony uh, before before closing this this opening ceremony i would like to invite professor rogerio to briefly present for us this is the main goals of the seminar please roger the word is yours Uh, I'd like to thank Eduardo and Johanna for the partnership, but also all the people and institutions involved in the organization of the seminar, particularly FAPESP. Uh, we are pleased to have the opportunity of gathering in Sao Paulo and through the internet, in the case of those in participating uh, online, specialists from different parts of the world and Brazilian colleagues to discuss hot topics in the study of federalism and politics on a territorial basis. Why federalism and democracy in an era of emergencies? The ambition of the seminar is to exchange knowledge on recent challenges faced by federations and other regional arrangements. Actually, challenges faced by the whole globe, but with particularities in the case of federations. We are mainly interested in reflections around three topics. The COVID-19 pandemic and what we can learn from this health emergency, the climate emergency and measures to mitigate it, threats to democratic governance in different national contexts and the potential of federations to deal with them. We also understand the seminar as an opportunity to bridge two worlds the world of academia and, the, and that of practitioners. We will learn about the activities of the Foreign Federations and the Brazilian Ministry of Institutional Relations, among other moments for exchange. In sum, the aim is to update our reflection on key contemporary topics, refine our conceptual tools, and hopefully build collaborations to improve our research and practice. We hope we all have a profitable seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Rogério. Uh, now I have one formal role I have to read to all of you, a disclaimer, um, because we have many people uh, watching this seminar through YouTube, so we have to formally declare these so I, I, I'm going to read formally, okay? All these statements expressed by Fundação Getúlio Vargas, employers and guests in our online events and broadcasts exclusively represent their opinions and not necessarily FGV's institutional position. We also reiterate that everyone present here agree to participate in this event of their own free while and they consented to be recorded in this broadcast which will be posted later on on FGV's official tenures, channels. To continue with this transmission, we ask that you express your agreement by verbalizing or signaling your agreement. So uh, before Andoji's, uh, now we left Andoji's opening table, so I would invite everyone to sit down and join us to participate in the seminar. We will start our first session inviting to compose this table professor alan fena from curtin university australia thank you once again alan
for accepting to, to be here with us, especially because I know your first time in South America and your first time in Brazil. And Professor Marta Retti, yes, because, oh, okay, you will use these, okay, 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 you're right, okay, F, after you, okay. Because I don't know if, yes, you, you, you will talk using this microphone, you're talking using. Okay, okay, so great, great. So Marta, you can, yes, you can wait, yes. Because I thought I thought that uh, while I, you could speak from here, but okay, no problem. You, you can use Alan. Go ahead. Feel free. No problem. You can. Uh, yes, yes, uh, yes. I, I, yes, exactly. Don't worry. So Rogério, if you want to sit here in order to coordinate the session, okay. We will sit here. Okay. So I'm going to sit as well. So Alan, please go ahead. You have 30, 30, 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. I just want to make sure this guy. Yeah. Otherwise, that's possible. Otherwise, it's get my PowerPoint up. Thanks, <laughs> Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, shall we get underway? Can anyone not hear me? Raise your hand if you can't hear a word I'm saying. That was a joke. Okay. Um, it is genuinely exciting to be here at this moment in Brazil for the first time on what sounds like a real threshold. So that, that's wonderful. I, um, I must say I could easily handle several dinners in an evening, but only because I love food, but not, uh, I don't think I could handle the rest of it. Uh, so that's very good. And I'm very glad that Eduardo rescheduled this event from the original date, which was the 7th of January, uh, to now. So I think that was, a, that was good too. But um, so my humble job here in the 30 minutes that I have is simply just to give a bit of an overview of federalism in general and uh, lay a little bit of a foundation for my more learned colleagues who will follow and develop some of the topics that I touch on briefly. Uh, so I'm providing what, what I think in um, Portuguese we would call a bizarre geral of the, uh, of the, uh, the terrain that we're, we're looking at. So um, where we should begin, I think, is just at the very beginning. So I will begin, I couldn't think of something more of a very beginning than what is a definition of federalism, not as easy as you might think to arrive at. So here I've, I've broken it down into three key features. The first is that a, a, feder a federation is a state, that is, it is not a, it's not a looser arrangement, it is, it is a state with a formal international identity and so on. One, secondly, whose territory is divided into self-governing jurisdictions, constituent units, as I'll use as a generic term for them, whether they be provinces, states, lender, cantons, or whatever you else you might like to call them. And the key third point is that they, those constituent units enjoy a genuine degree of autonomy. And I'll come back to the autonomy aspect a bit later as well. So that, that, that is fundamental to the definition is the, notice, the notion of the autonomy of those constituent units. So just to broaden that out a bit, and, this, and yes, while this does refer to the spectrum of types of federal uh, formations, uh, it, it is not comprehensive. There, I, I've 
had to leave various interesting variations out. But here, just very simply to put federalism on in the middle of a spectrum between confederal arrangements, looser ones where the central government is not actually a, a proper state. So, and I, the two examples I've given there are the United Arab Emirates uh, and the European Union. Uh, so where you, you, you don't have the degree of integration uh, to form a federal system, but only a looser confederal system. So in that sense, this, it is the central government that lacks the adequate autonomy to be, make it a federal system, not rather. And then at the other extreme, it's the constituent units that lack the requisite authority uh, to make it a federal system. We see numerous examples of these, quite exciting, some of them quite exciting examples. Some of them we could think of as emergent federations. Uh, uh, sorry, that's what I'm referring to, the first uh, sometimes emergent federations, but also sometimes with these devolutionary developments as well. Um, perhaps the UK will become a federal system one day, I'm skeptical, but you, you never know. Um, and there's significant important degrees of devolution in places like Italy. An interesting example is Spain, where it is a country that is regarded by many scholars as indeed a federation, but to my mind is it is uh, it's, a, it's an open question whether the, the uh, autonomous communities have genuinely have sufficient autonomy to make it a true federal system. It's, a, it, it's rather actually difficult to judge, I think. So just to give a sense that to my mind, there's a very wide spectrum of forms of government that are, have a federal character to so, some degree or another, but only in the sweet spot in the middle. Uh, would we call them, them true federations? And then there's a range of other, other phenomena that I would put under various headings. One of them are quasi-federations, where the, the, a federation very much in appearance perhaps, but in practice uh, with, with insufficient autonomy at all to be, to, be fe to be described as federal. And then there's at the real extreme, there's fake federations, of which Russia is a, a, a prime example, where, uh, where there's a symbolic practice of federalism that may be useful politically within the country, but in reality, there is little or no federal practice whatsoever because of autocratic government and central control and so on and so forth. And part of this emphasizes, we always have to keep in mind when talking about federalism, is that there's two interrelated dimensions. There's the fact that federalism is a formal constitutional order, an institutional setup, but actually how it works is very much uh, um, at the mercy of other forces, political forces, economic forces, fiscal forces, and so on, uh, and to determine whether the appearance actually is the reality. So having said what uh, is the essence of federalism, we now have to, uh, have to highlight the fact that federalism has various other important aspects, not crucial to its, its identity, but crucial to its reality perhaps, crucial to its practice, of which I identify here three. One is if it's going to be a constitutionally defined order, then there really needs to be a neutral arbiter, an umpire of the system uh, but, uh, to adjudicate disputes about who has what power and so on. And in almost all cases, that is an independent, an independent judiciary. Uh, but I say almost because uh, that Switzerland is a partial exception to this. I, uh, perhaps the world's most iconic federation, um, but one that doesn't, uh, where, the, where the federal government is not subordinate to rulings on these sort of federal issues uh, not subordinate to a, a Supreme Court or a, a constitutional court. The second uh, associated feature I would draw attention to, a problematic one, is bicameralism. And we, there is a strong affinity between federalism and bicameralism. Almost all federations have second chambers, but only almost all, and the fact is those second chambers vary enormously in what role they play, what powers they have, and to the extent to which they can be described as territorially representative. 
So their role and importance in federalism is very unclear. And we're, we're very lucky that we have an expert on bicameralism here who will be talking much at much greater length about these issues, my colleague, Dr. Suris from Germany. So that um, is a very much a case by case, you might say, aspect of looking at federalism is the role the territorial second chambers play. And it's not clear, let's, uh, how constructive a role, you might say, they play. So we're, that, that I'm very much looking forward to our further discussions on, on that question. And then the third one is something that is not necessarily institutionally formalized at all in federal systems and is most commonly rather much less so, is mechanisms for relationships between the orders of government, of course. And the classic federations made virtually no allowance for this. The assumption was typically that um, that it, that it wasn't necessary. They would operate in their separate spheres. The governments didn't really need to speak to each other. That, of course, is far from the reality today. So intergovernmental relations is an unavoidable, essential, practical feature of uh, federalism. Uh, but again, one that ha tends to have very modest degree of institutionalization uh, and varies fluctuates over time according to the issues and the governments and so on. And again, we'll have expert uh, uh, elaboration on these sort of questions later on. <coughs> One th um, thing, recurrent question or theme that we'll also come back to and have, have expert attention given to later on in the session is the relationship between federalism and, and democracy. And there's a question about the relationship in each direction. So, first of all, can you have a federation without being democratic? And there are many reasons to think that, that certainly to have a properly functioning or true federal system, you do have to be genuinely democratic. You do have to have a, be a liberal democracy, because primarily because the autonomy of the constituent units cannot be ensured without the force of the rule of law uh, and constitutionalism, uh, that these will be respected uh, and 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 not overridden by political forces. So there's a very strong argument that federalism does require require democracy. Con confederalism certainly doesn't. So the United Arab Emirates could not be accused of being democratic, uh, and uh, but it certainly is confederal. Uh, but federalism truly, it's it's very difficult to imagine without without it being not impossible but difficult. And then vice versa, is democracy, this is in some ways a more interesting question, is democracy enhanced by federalism? And here it's one, a bit of one of those, it depends answers. Uh, it depends on various uh, aspects, other broader aspects of the political system. But on the one hand, it might uh, be um, something, uh, um, federalism enhances democracy because of this notion that by having a second tier of, of governments, you're bringing government closer to the people, more closer democratic connection. Uh, and also that the two orders of government can provide some sort of check and balance against each other in a time when perhaps that might be needed. Uh, so there's certainly an argument and there are examples uh, of where that's occurred, where federalism enhances democratic practice, but it needn't be the case, of course. And particularly, it needn't be the case because since federalism is about maintaining the autonomy of the constituent units, what if that autonomy then allows those constituent units to continue with practices that are contrary to, dem to democracy? So there's a fine balance to be struck there, and there's certainly uh, a, a concern uh, at various times heightened by events uh, about the potential for federalism to harbor illiberal practices and undemocratic practices um, with it. And of course, um, there's no better case than this than the United States, where federalism, uh, a famous federalism scholar said, said in the 60s uh, that if you are a federalist, you are a racist because federalism allows the segregationist uh, racism of the American South. And that's, so that's the, the other side of the coin when it comes to the relationship between federalism and, and democracy. So these are contingent, obviously contingent outcomes. 
So let's return to that autonomy and say at the heart of what makes a federal system is the division of powers. If you're going to have two orders of government, both with, it, with a direct relationship with the people and an important role to play, then there must be an effective division of powers. And implicitly or explicitly underpinning that division of powers is the principle of subsidiarity, the principle that whatever can be done at the more local level should be done at the more local level. It's, an, it's the normative principle that underpins the federal idea. It doesn't mean it always happens and it doesn't mean it's always easy to decide or determine what things are actually local by, by nature. But, it, but it, it, it all, that notion always hovers in the background uh, when you think about federalism and the division of powers. So there are a number of practical questions that also arise when talking about federalism and the division of powers, which is how should those powers be divided? And when we look around the world, we see two kind of ideal typical models. Uh, one, the dualist model uh, developed in the United States and practiced in, a, in particularly in Australia and Canada, where the two orders of government are assigned full policy making implementation and administration powers within defined policy domains. So that, and, and, and so they're in a sense fully autonomous. That if you're in charge of policing as a, as a constituent unit, then you're in charge of policing policy, you're in charge of the police force, you're in charge of the whole, uh, the whole sector as a discrete and self-contained sector. Then the archetypal other model the German model is of administrative division of powers, whereby there's there not all in not all domains, but in an, in key domains, the division is not between policy dom domains; it's between the role of making policy and the role of imp of implementing and administering that policy. So a very different way of dividing powers, uh, which to, which entails that the constituent units have some input into how that policy is made. And again, bicameralism, we'll, we'll hear about German bicameralism <coughs> in, that, in that context later on. So two in principle, two quite different models. But over time, there has been a blurring of the distinction, particularly because of the evolution of the dualist federations, whereby if you think of the subsidiarity principle again, whereby more and more tasks of government have become broader in, sc in scale across a, and seen as of national dimension rather than just local dimension. Uh, particularly with the federations formed prior to the 20th century, most governmental functions were seen as local in nature, whether it was healthcare, education, these, was, these were seen as intrinsically local, had no national dimension. That is not, of course, the case today, particularly with the emergence of the redistributive Keynesian welfare state after the Second World War, where all of a sudden the largest role functions of government were intrinsically national all of a sudden in nature. So what has developed in some of those dualist federations is a de facto, not de jure, but de facto administrative division of powers within the dualist federations, whereby uh, a number, national policy will be made in areas that are technically the, the jurisdiction of the constituent units. Uh, and then the constituent units will have the task, the unenviable task in some way of implementing and administering because that's what they've been told to do in an area that used to be their jurisdiction. So there's, there's been a, a corruption of the old dualist systems uh, that they, they have taken on an appearance of, uh, or converge to some extent with the, with the classic administrative federations. By the way, I meant to say at the outset, if there's anything or even a word I use that's not clear, please don't hesitate to, to interrupt. Um, if there's anything you disagree with, just pretend you didn't hear it. But if there's anything you want <laughs> clarifying, don't hesitate to put your hand up and ask, OK? So. This is all fine and good, but I've sort of hinted at this next point in, in my, at the end of the last slide, which is it's one thing to have a certain division of powers on paper and in a constitution, but when push comes to shove, it's typically money that counts. 
So fiscal federalism is crucial to understanding the, f the operation of, in reality of any federal system, the power of the purse and so on. So most prescriptive federalism theory holds that the, the allocation of f uh, or the access to revenues should be aligned fairly nicely to the allocation of responsibilities. That is to say, if, if the constituent units have a certain task to do, then they should be have access to the tax revenue to execute that task. Uh, and that is not what happens in most federal systems, primarily because it is much easier to level most taxes effectively across a whole country than it is at the constituent unit level. And there are various ways to address but this, but there's a strong tendency for the consequence of vertical fiscal imbalance to follow, which is to say a situation where the central government has access to tax revenues that it controls in considerable excess of its spending needs and vice versa for the constituent units to have spending responsibilities that they cannot fund out of their own revenue, which mean, leads to the reliance on transfers to the constituent units from central governments. And these can take, generally speaking, one of two forms. They can either be unconditional general funding, uh, which is, is what autonomy, the, the autonomy rule would prescribe. But of course, the temptation to use those grants as a mechanism uh, for influencing policy in constituent units is too great to resist and depending on the federation uh, is often the case. So in Australia, conditional grants make up 50% of all the transfers to the states and the states are heavily dependent on the Commonwealth government transfers. Conditional grants have long been a major a prominent element of American federalism as well. In other other federations, there are other means of addressing this problem. Uh, and perhaps if we need to, we can come back in discussion to those sort of things. So that's the vertical dimension uh, of the fiscal problem. And of course, then there's the horizontal dimension of the fiscal problem, the relationship. It's one thing to say that the central government has more money than the constituent units, but the constituent units, of course, are never equal in a federation. Uh, and in some federations more so than <coughs> others, there is a substantial fiscal disparity, economic and fiscal disparity between the constituent units, from one constituent unit to the next. And rumor has it that that is the case in Brazil, for instance. So almost all federations then practice formally some kind of horizontal fiscal equalization, whereas money is moved across the country, not just down, but redistributed across the country on the principle that everybody who is Brazilian is a citizen of Brazil and should have access to a reasonably equal standard of basic public services, but, you know, Canadian, whatever the case may be. Uh, but also there's a practical logic behind this, which is that if, uh, if a number of constituent units are very poor and do not have access on their, to the resources necessary to provide the kind of services citizens wants, then there's a strong pressure on the central government to move in and provide those services itself, which tends to undermine the principle of federalism. So it invites more federal intervention if you don't have equalization, because otherwise, how are you going to get a degree of citizen-based social provision equally across the country if it is not by the federal government stepping in and taking that role itself. So there is a practical argument as well as you might say a moral or citizenship argument in favor of equalization. The problem of course with equalization is that the politics is rather different from the moral aspect. This is a highly visible zero sum game about with, with money flowing from one jurisdiction to another. There is absolutely no problem seeing that I've been robbed to help Hoyle get a nice pink shirt to wear today. So it's, 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 it's cringingly obvious what's going on. And of course, that then plays into political conflict very directly. And it's exacerbated by two things, potentially. One is 
the degree of disparity, if, if there's disparities that need to be corrected but they're modest, then that's not a big challenge. But if they're big disparities, that's make, that, ex that accentuates the political problem. And moreover, it accentuates it even further if recipient jurisdictions are highly populous jurisdictions. Because then, of course, per capita, a small per capita amount that has to be transferred ends up to being a very large amount. So in Australia, for instance, for most of the history of fiscal, of the fiscal, of fiscal federalism, the rich jurisdictions were also highly the, the two big populous jurisdictions. So they had to give up only a very small proportion of their aggregate to help out the smaller, poorer jurisdictions. Then the tables turned a bit and one of the low population jurisdictions became rich, which meant it had to give up a huge amount of its wealth to help compensate the rest of the country. So those accidents of history, you might say, have a big, asp big impact on how equalization works. And uh, as it was a very, the conditions were very benign and conducive in Australia. So we had, and I'll come to this in a well, my next point really about degrees of equalization. So in Australia, we had, let's call it 100% equalization. So the, the, the system ensured that every jurist, each jurisdiction was funded just as well as any other jurisdiction. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, funded by the wealth of the two big states. Um, now, once, once the tables t turn a bit, and a smaller jurisdiction is, is, is a, a, a big contributor, then, of course, the pressure is on to have something other than 100%. And so political pressure led to the system being watered down a bit. So, so the, the, the small state that had, has all the money, happens to be my state, so I'm speaking apologetically, insisted out of greediness that it not give up all that money. The 100% the, the equalization all of a sudden seemed like a, a, an immoral, um, means an, or goal and so they were able to force the federal government to water down the system so that it's less than 100% equalization. It's not as close to say the Canadian system where see in Australia every, there was a, an average established and everyone was brought either up or down to that average. In the Canadian system only the poorer ones are brought up to an average, the richer ones still get to stay, stay rich. They're just the poorer ones aren't, aren't, aren't um, you know, get some subsidy. So it all tied in with these, these different political and economic realities of a particular federal system. And it's also connected with the actual mechanism by which equalization is carried out. And the cruelest way in some ways to do equalization is to say to one rich state, right, you will transfer a hundred million dollars to this poor state here. And that, that is really making it patently and transparently zero sum. The Canadian system is, is indirect such, such that the funding for equalization comes out of the federal government budget rather than being explicitly transferred from province to province. However, of course, what the rich provinces then say is, yeah, but we pay disproportionately into your budget, so we're still paying, um, but at least it's a little bit less transparent. Uh, and it's not so much rubbing their noses in, in, in it. Uh, so the Australian system is, creates a pool the taxes, the tax revenue is raised by the central government, the Commonwealth, um, assigned to the states, and then it's divided up between. That's a nice hand. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Very quickly, then, the the last aspect of fiscal federalism we have to keep in mind about is is not just taxing and spending, but also borrowing money, and this has been at various times a problem in federal systems, um, and the risk being of unconstrained borrowing by constituent units that then is fiscally destabilizing for the country and there's been various mechanisms and approaches have evolved over the years to this and I've, I've characterized them here as one is the sink or swim approach which is if a constituent unit borrows stupidly and goes bankrupt that's its problem it has to deal with it sink or swim uh, which is the US or Canadian approach and then the the other is when there's a paternalistic regulation from above, 
um, some sort of joint borrowing arrangement, collective borrowing, and some sort of regulation and control over how extensive that borrowing at the constituent unit level is. And that has been, until recently, the Australian practice by contrast. So my last topic I wanted to bring you, which is really to debouch onto the, the, the theme of this session, which is thinking about federalism and policy making in crisis times. And what I wanted to hear was just draw attention to three questions. One of them is the possible benefits simply of having two tiers of government or more. That's why I've got the plus sign there. That's not a typing error. Um, and what one American scholar has called compensatory federalism, that federalism offers this potential that if one, if the central government fails and doesn't do what it ought to be doing in a situation, then there's, there's a fail safe, there's a backup. The constituent units can compensate for failure of action at the central government level. So there I've used two examples to illustrate that. One is climate change, that's what the CC stands for, and the other is COVID. In both cases we see examples in different countries where there was inaction at the central government level. Uh, I'm sure that never happened here, but it certainly happened in, in, in Australia. Um, and uh, in, in respect of uh, certainly of climate change that um, that the in Australia the states stepped up and took uh, a very active role and in fact carried carried forward a, collectively a de facto national policy on climate change that the federal government refused to do until it changed hands politically then then there's the second possible benefit of federalism which is not so much just the fact of having two orders of government but having a devolved response, having a fragmented response. And we often think of fragmentation as a bad thing. It's got a sort of pejorative connotation sometimes. But um, it has a few potential benefits, one of which is locally, and this is famously an advantage of federalism, locally tailored responses, so that individual jurisdictions can do what is most suitable to their particular circumstances. And I think, again, we've seen evidence of that to some extent with climate change and, and COVID, uh, because they're in climate change, their industrial structure and so on will be very different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And in COVID, of course, the, it may well have been the case that the degree, the impact varied enormously from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So different measures, stringency in particular of measures uh, the appropriate strategy varied considerably from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. The second aspect of the devolved response is, and this is COVID is the classic example, is the ability to quarantine a problem to within one part of the country. So in, in my home country of Australia, for instance, there was one state that was very hard hit and all the other states just closed their borders to that state. So you were locked into Victoria if you, if, uh, for two years. Uh, and you couldn't get into my home state of, for two years uh, from any other part of Australia. Uh, uh, um, so there was, federalism allowed a real quarantining. Interestingly enough, that was entirely against the constitution, but it was seen as a, um, as a justifiable exception to the rule of the constitution. And then there is the possibility for interjurisdictional learning that you can look over the border and see, wow, they're doing an interesting job there, or that approach seems to be working, we should adopt that and, 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 um, and use that. And the, the evidence is always a bit slim for how much that actually occurs, but the potential is certainly there, I can't be denied. But just to finish on a depressing note, if you don't mind, Eduardo, uh, there is always the potential costs and downsides to federalism and the devolved response. One of which we see that particularly with climate change is, yeah, well, I'm doing, your, I'm doing my bit, but are you doing your bit? And I've just finished for the Forum of Federations a book on climate change governance. And one thing that came out of there was the, the, the most clear case of this in particular, probably the two most clear cases, Canada and Brazil. So you have jurisdictions that do a lot about climate change, but then you have jurisdictions that are contributing enormously to the problem itself. Uh, and, and so federalism, if it's a devolved response, can simply allow the bad guys to get away with it. A bit like it can allow oppressive anti-democratic 
jurisdictions to continue with their regimes. So there's always this, this risk of shirking in, a, in, in those kind of, of situations. And then finally, which will uh, lead us to uh, another presentation from one of my more learned colleagues, is um, the challenges of getting governments and the importance of getting governments to work effectively together. Autonomy goes hand in hand with cooperation and coordination. And on that lovely note, I would like to end it there and pass the baton. Yes, I guess so. Yeah. Okay, I can see here. Okay. It's bad. Okay. But I can. Can I use this? Huh? Okay. Okay. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Rogério and Eduardo for. Uh, okay, I should. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. So, good morning, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank Eduardo and uh, Rogério and Johanna, if uh, where is she? No, she, okay. for having thought of my name. Uh, so and for having organizing uh, organized this meeting so thanks a lot i'll do my best um i'll try to do my best and i thought that uh, as i am the first brazilian to talk about brazil it would be my task to present uh, the institutional choices of the constitutional constitution framers so in order to uh, uh, to better inform those that are not familiar with the brazilian institutions uh, and to present what i think is the main divine of brazilian uh, federalism so as to let's say inform the participants of uh, how the brazilian uh, 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 federal state uh, operates. And then I'll present some uh, input for the discussion, mainly addressing some uh, idea, uh, presenting some ideas about what we have learned uh, from COVID-19 and, and of our uh, experience in preventing democratic uh, backsliding. But it's just some, uh, let's say, the first part is the result of uh, of research, of studies, so it's, uh, and the, the second part is more speculative and it's uh, presents some uh, inputs for our uh, today's uh, discussion. So, um, it's very, okay, it's, uh, it's so Brazil is a fair country, as you know, so it has a central government. It has 26 uh, states and uh, a federal uh, district and nearly uh, six, uh, uh, so it's five, so five, uh, 1,570 municipalities. So it's a large uh, federation. Um, important to better understand Brazil, uh, either local governments and states have the same status, meaning that uh, unlike most federations, municipalities are not state creatures in Brazil and in many aspects, local governments are directly connected to the central, central government. Um, uh, and but, but in spite of the big differences in the size of municipalities, they all must have the same administrative administrative format. So the city of Sao Paulo has nearly 
uh, 12 uh, million inhabitants, whereas 20% of Brazilian municipalities have less than 5,000 inhabitants, but according to the constitution, they must, all must have the same uh, administrative status. Um, Another a particularity of the Brazilian Federation is that the union, uh, the federal government, is allowed to uh, initiate legislation in any matter except the public safety and metro areas, which are exclusive of uh, states. But it means that the central government ca can be very, very active in in, in, in setting the rules of the uh, in any area of uh, of uh, public uh, policy in pre and but any level of government can indeed make policy in any area but in practice to make it simpler which is very very difficult to describe there is a kind of division of labor between the central government which is which makes indeed makes policy uh in in the makes income policies so Bolsa Familia, which is a very non-program, pensions, uh, uh, um, employment, uh, let, let me look for the employment, insurance, cash transfer programs are all directly, uh, let's say, managed, implemented by the central governments, but states and municipalities operate in these, uh, uh, in these, in the, in the in the operation of the the, the, the whole system, whereas uh, whereas uh, states and municipalities are very very active in service policies. It does not mean that the central government is not there. Uh, it's uh, quite the opposite. The central government is very active in setting the rules of, uh, of um, service policies and funding service policies, but muni mainly municipalities are very, very active in providing in executing service policies. It's very complicated to describe that, but I would summarize um, uh, uh, present the, giving you an example of two policies. First, um, the, we are now uh, discussing uh, the, 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 a tax reform on the uh, consumption uh, uh, area is uh, is being processed in, in the center in the, in Congress in Brazil. Currently, each as the states are in charge of the consumption tax. Each state has its own list of the, uh, its own back basket of the items that are ex exempted for taxation. If this reform eventually gets approved, we will have a central list of the basket of items that should be exempted for uh, of uh, taxation states can have uh, can add some items in their list but they can, they are obliged to comply with the federal list okay um, on health states are in charge and municipalities main are in charge of delivering health uh, services but they should comply with a long list of rules that are set by the federal constitution. It means, and it, it's very important, that the, 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 the central government in Brazil is very, very active in setting the rules of the policies that are, in, in, in fact, implemented by um, uh, states and in municipalities. Um, Second, if we 
apply the Elizabeth uh, Hoog and collaborators um, model to compare the Brazilian Federation with the rules of the Brazilian, the, the institutions of the Brazilian Federation with other Latin American countries, we can conclude that, uh, sorry, that I, I, we can conclude that it's easier to get here. We can conclude that on the self-rule dimension, Brazil is more similar to some large unitary states of Latin America than to other uh, federations due to the broad competences of the union. Yeah, uh, states and municipalities in Brazil are not allowed to create new taxes that are not listed in the constitution and we are going ahead into the direction of even the rates that states and municipalities apply to their own taxes are set by the federal uh, legislation that's the matter of the current uh, uh, tax reform states and municipalities are not allowed to 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 borrow uh, without uh, um, federal um, previous agreement so they are, they are uh, they have some room of, of, of autonomy to in the dimension of implementation or, or in the administrative dimension as uh, Alan has just uh, said but most of the poli most policies uh, implemented by um, by the states and municipalities are uh, let's say, regulated by federal legislation, meaning that the di dimension of self-rule in Brazilian uh, federalism is more similar to decentralized um, uh, unitary states in Latin America than to classical uh, federations. Whereas in the shared rule uh, dimension, Brazil is very similar to classical federations. We have a bicameral, symmetric bicameralism. Senators are elected by parties and so on, except by the fact that our constitution is, I would say, quite easy to change. We have a rate of four amendments a year in our uh, constitution. So it's the most difficult, uh, let's say, uh, leg legislative uh, legislation uh, to change, to, to be changed in Brazil, but it's comparatively easier as compared to other uh, federations. That said, the, as the authority, legislation making is concentrated in the center, and the uh, so the, uh, uh, the we and uh, shared uh, rule uh, institutions are and, and the, the constitution unions uh, are represented in the center. Uh, the question turns out to be what's the main divide of Brazilian federation? So we don't have in Brazil divisions like. Uh, let's say we important and meaningful distinct divisions like let's say regional identification ethnic uh, religion divisions and so on the main the main divide of the brazilian federation is socio economic so and here are the poorest regions in the north and northeast and here are the uh, uh, Rich, richest regions in the south and southeast. The center west used to be uh, aligned with the poorer regions, but the center where there, there is a, 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 a change, an important change going on in Brazilian now because the center west region that used to be poor now is a very very affluent uh, uh, region and this economic change 
is changing the way that the political bargain in Brazil uh, operates. And it has, um, it, it deeply affects uh, Brazilian uh, uh, politics. But the, the point here is that two points are important. Richer regions are fewer in number, whereas poorer regions are larger uh, in number. Second, the great part, and our colleagues from the federal, from the federal government can, can uh, confirm that or not, the lion's share of the bargaining were for less to autonomy and more to who are the winners and the losers in the fiscal schemes, which are very, very complicated because we have a very, some, some say that we don't have a fiscal system. We have a, a kind of crazy house who, which nobody understands. And so most bargains are made in a veil of ignorance because nobody knows what would be the outcome of any decision. Uh, it's, it's, I, I'm ex exaggerating, but I'm saying that here that uh, bargains around who are the net losers and who are the net winners of, um, of uh, central decisions are very, very important in the in, in, in the operation and uh, in the Brazilian Federation. So, the, so that said, the, the question is how states uh, and constituent unions are represented in central arenas. So, in the lower chamber, so Brazil has a, a, a to allocate, uh, malapportionment is the rule in the allocation of, uh, of uh, seats in Brazil. Every, every political science knows this uh, discussion. This is a very controversial uh, decision because it violates the principle of one man, one vote. But my argument with the discussion is that this, the, this, this, the rules, the formula of mal, mal apportionment in Brazil performs a very, very important role of preserving the balance of the Brazilian Federation. Why? Because poorest states, as they are larger in number, they are the majority in the upper chamber. Whereas they are the minority in the lower chamber. Whereas richer states are, have nearly a majority in the lower chamber, but they, they are a minority in the upper chamber. So this, of course, this picture does not take into account parties, which makes things more complicated. But if a party controlled the the total number of seats of uh, each state, yeah, uh, the result would be that uh, there is no, not neither richer nor poorer states are able to form a majority in both houses at the same time. So as we have a symmetric bi bicameralism, this formula forces, pushes toward negotiation around this socioeconomic bargain. This is gonna change depending, this equilibrio tends to change if depending on the position of the center west because the center west tends, tends to be the pivotal voters in many uh, debates. And this is a very, very important issue on the current tax reform because it's gonna change. 
uh, part of our, uh, our um, um, tax system. So that said, just to, let's say, inform those that, that uh, are not familiar with the Brazilian institutions with I, what I think are the main wounds of the Brazilian uh, federations. Now I'm, I'm uh, entering into, let's say, a more, okay, I'll be, I have tried to be brief. Uh, uh, what we've learned about COVID, I, to make uh, uh, the argument simple, I would say that there were two parties in Brazil as, let's say, regarding fighting the, the fight against COVID, uh, and, and I think it describes many countries. We had in Brazil a negationist party, which, uh, uh, let's say, didn't align with the orientation of scientists and a scientific party. So, yeah, the word party here is a very, very, uh, let's say, free denomination, but we have two, two, two strains of thought. The negationist party in Brazil was not small. Many states, many governors aligned with uh, this, uh, this party. And the president in Brazil was the leader of the negationist party. So we had in Brazil a very, very dangerous, risky situation because we have a federation that concentrates authority in the center, concentrates authority in the presidency, and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, the president was the leader of the negationist uh, party. As a leader of the negationist party, the president uh, enacted a, a decree on the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, stating that states and municipalities would not be allowed to make decisions on people's mobility. So he, he intended to, try to tie the hands of the opposition party. And he was defeated by the Supreme Court, which who made a very unorthodox interpretation of the Constitution, so as to side with the, let's say, scientific uh, party. So wh what, wh what are the, what we've learned from, the, from COVID-19, of course, I'm packing a very complicated story in just seconds, yeah. Unorthodox because because it's controversial. The the if the um, Supreme Court interpretation of the Constitution was correct, and more important, the Supreme Court used it to cite the federal government. It was the first time in the long period of dispute on, on the on concurrent competences that uh, the Supreme Court did not cite the federal government. So my interpretation is that they made an unorthodox interpretation of the Constitution so as to align with the scientific uh, party, right? So, so, what saved what saved the lives in Brazil? The independence of judiciary, in the fact that the judiciary was aligned with the scientific party, the subnational autonomy, so states could implement the health policy and make decisions on, on people's uh, mobility, and the fact that the uh, uh, states and municipalities are indeed in, char in charge of health policies in Brazil and have the state capacities to implement uh, this policy. Reasoning in counterfactual terms, if the judiciary was not, were not independent, if subnational governments were not autonomous, if they had no capacity to, uh, to, to implement health policies, we would have had much more deaths in Brazil. On the other hand, the fact that the Ministry of Health was controlled by the negationist party, and, and we, we have a, a indeed multi-level governance in the, the, the 
health policy, we did have coordination uh, prob problems in Brazil. And third, the electoral comp, the, the, pre the governor of Sao Paulo aimed at running for president and the governor of Sao Paulo developed our uh, a state level vaccine. And so the electoral competition, the president faced by the governor of Sao Paulo was key for push him towards uh, adopt some of the policies, um, uh, uh, let's say, defended by the scientific party. I'm, I'm running out of my time, just one second. I, we can come back to this discussion afterwards. Uh, uh, has Brazilian federal federalism played a role in preventing democratic backsliding? Yes and no, uh, because President Bolsonaro was very, very successful as a leader of the far extreme right in Brazil. At the end of his presidency, this extreme, extreme right in Brazil was much more organized than it was at the beginning of his presidency. It, it means that extreme right is not, uh, we didn't move, <laughs> the, 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 it, it is still there and more organized and active and popular than it was uh, in the beginning of his presidency. But what, uh, let's say, uh, he, he, you might know that, he, he wanted, he wanted to get reelected or to, let's say, to contest uh, the, the, the election results. What was important for the, this, um, the, the, for the, let's say, to, to, to deter uh, the, 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 what we call in Brazil, indeed, uh, a coup d'etat. We almost have had that in Brazil. So the fact, the independence uh, of the judiciary and the fact that the judiciary was in favor of democratic institutions at, a, at many points. It was the only branch in the Brazilian system that, uh, uh, that uh, let's say, um, fought, fought the president. Uh, the fact that, so the independence of the electoral courts, the independence of the media, and a very, very important uh, detail. Elections for state governors, state assemblies, for the ch uh, lower chamber and the upper chamber, chamber were held at the same day of the elections for president. So, if the, 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 the former president wanted to contest the victory of Lula, he would be obliged to contest all these elections that were held at the same day. So this is an institution of federalism that was very important to deter the, the but uh, I agree uh, with, with Alan that there is a, a two direction, uh, let's say, causation mechanism between democracy and federalism, and it's hard to say which of them, uh, neither of them uh, isolated can explain uh, these results. So, sorry, very, very sorry. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Marta. Now we have some minutes for our break. So maybe 50 minutes. We have some snacks and, and coffee and water. And after that, we'll have some discussion with the whole audience. Uh, so pray, prepare your questions to Alan, Professor Marta Hatch. So please make yourself.
Hello. Excuse me, people. Let's resume the session, please. We're now going to a Q and A. Thank you. Just a second, because we have to be sure that we are on the internet. Oh, of course. Yeah. Just a few seconds so that we go back on the internet. Okay, thank you. Let's start, resume the session with the Q&A. Um, I don't know, would you like to suggest a, a method? Let's, let's just take some questions and, okay, it's a good method. I, I, I would invite those that will uh, use the word to, to take the word, that identify themselves, please. You, please. Uh, I would like him to tell us a bit about the Council of uh, Australian Governments, which I think is a very interesting coordination mechanism. I was afraid somebody would ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> because, and some of my colleagues might judge it slightly differently, but um, I do fear it's one of those things that is better seen, looks better from a distance than it does from close up. It looks like more than it is from a distance, I'm afraid. It's a fancy name, and I should just contextualize a bit for everyone in the room, is that the peak level body for intergovernmental relations in Australia since 1991 has been called the Council of Australian Governments. It is really just a occasional and very brief meeting of the Prime Minister and the Premiers and the Chief Ministers of the two self-governing territories. Uh, uh, and so it, and it has a secretariat, small secretariat, but it's not independent, it's in the Prime Minister's department. So the, the name sounds a lot grander than the actual reality. Um, it has been an important meeting at various times, but uh, at particular episodes, but it is, it is still just a meeting. It's not an, an institution in any way. It doesn't have any legislative basis. It doesn't, statutory basis, it has, it's not even, we make quite um, extensive use in Australia of formal intergovernmental written agreements. But, but the Council of Australian Governments, COAG as we like to call it, is not based even on an intergovernmental agreement. So when the COVID pandemic started in 2020, there was a meeting of, Co of COAG, and then immediately afterwards, the Prime Minister said, COAG is over, it's finished, it's gone. Just announced that it's, it's, it's eliminated. And that it would re be replaced with, with a new body with an even more exciting name called National Cabinet. And National Cabinet is, that sounds wow, that sounds very good. Because cabinet, of course, is a powerful, um, cohesive body that makes major decisions. But again, it's, it was a rhetorical device, the name was a rhetorical device for a meeting that just happens to occur a bit more frequently uh, and with less formal um, support from the, the uh, senior officers and, re, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the bureaucracy. So, Sadly, I must say that it is very easy to overestimate the significance of the, but these two peak level intergovernmental relations bodies in Australia. And I, I, I do hate to break it to you, but that is, that is the reality. Sorry, I'll just add a footnote to that is that 
one, one of the distinguishing features of Kaiagudu is completely dominated by the Prime Minister. So nothing made it onto the agenda that the Prime Minister didn't want on the agenda. It wasn't held unless the Prime Minister called it. Uh, and nothing got through COAG unless the Prime Minister supported it. National Cabinet was a bit different because one of the great things about federalism in the pandemic is that almost everything to do with managing the pandemic was in the hands of the states. So National Cabinet was a much more um, a meeting of equals, much more of a meeting of equals, while the pandemic lasted. But unfortunately, the pandemic came to an end. So. <laughs> Well, unfortunately for federals. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Please. Uh, just the microphone. Hello, my name is Norbert Kessin. I'm a professor for comparative local government in Münster University, Germany. Uh, I have one question. Alan, Alan you Sorry. did... You, can you hear it? Yeah, okay. yeah, just yeah. when you speak a bit slower. Sure. Okay. Um, the question is, I mean, you said that it's a zero-sum game when it comes to the, the, to the equivalents, but in fact you, you had an example where you could show that some of the money was spent as seed money to develop a province which became the, one of the richer ones. So it is not, it is, I mean, we, in Germany we have the discussion of the same, but it's finally Bavaria got the money in the 60s, 70s, and now it is one of the payers in this in this fund. So it can be the opposite. Uh, and the question to Marta, um, 5,000 sounds very small number when it comes to the number of municipalities in Brazil, because mm -hmm. you have, I mean, Italy has, is much smaller in Germany, we have 8,000, 10,000. Uh, but what you said, there is a big number of small communes and cities. And the question is how, is there anything, uh, is there a kind of intercommunal cooperation? Could you elaborate a little bit on this? Is there more, I mean, of co as we know it from other countries, it's very com complicated with amalgamation because it's an identity thing. Or is there a, s a second tier of districts and what could be the solution to help the smaller co cities and communes? Go ahead, and then we'll... Okay. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, this is the the the, uh, the fact that Brazilian uh, municipalities have this uh, must have, according to this uh, the constitution, the same administrative um, uh, model, in spite of being in, in uh, more than that uh, obligations uh, regarding policy, in spite of being very, very uh, difficult, di uh, different in size and, and in needs is a very, very important challenge in the Brazilian Federation. Uh, and in, 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 let's say, in political terms, there, there are only three layers of government. So in, in the sense that um, they are the only bodies that are directly elected by the, 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 uh, the citizens. There are a number of uh, consortia, consor is that the word in the consortia, consortia? Uh, uh, but they are not binding. So uh, it's uh, in the, uh, it's a, a, a voluntary decision uh, of each municipality, and so they can join together around a number of. But the, the way they, they get together and they join is regulated by the federal legislation. So it's not uh, the adhesion is free, but the format is not uh, is not uh, free. And there are also metropolitan areas. Uh, that result from the um, from the aggregation of uh, cities uh, located in metropolitan areas, but this is uh, exclusive to states, and, and so it varies a lot the the way they are uh, organized. Uh, an important uh, point. Uh, to think about the future uh, or the possible solutions uh, regarding this difference is the fact that this is my take but I, is that either the federal governments or the state governments fear the creation of a fourth layer of uh, government because they they understand that it it would be an, an additional 
source of pressures uh, upon them. And so I, my, my bet that is that it's hard to change that uh, due to this uh, fear uh, either federal governments or state level governments uh, have. Um, but this is a, a big, big, big issue in, in, in the Brazilian uh, Federation indeed, because um, most municipalities are in charge of performing policies they, they do not need, or they, uh, so there is no reason for that. And about fiscal equalization, yes, indeed, the winners and losers of equalization do sometimes change over time. But there's two realities here I think we must keep in mind. One is it, it may not change over time. It may go on forever. And that's, for instance, uh, for the last X number of decades has been the Canadian case. The, you know, the Eastern Maritime provinces have been beneficiaries and beggars for, for decades. Um, the second thing, and, and yes, this is a, I think is an underlying moral, moral notion of equalization is we have this expression in English, swings and roundabouts, the idea being that, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, you know, so it all, it all equals out in the end. Um, but A, it doesn't tend to equal out in the end. It's, it's, I think it's rare exceptions. But B, it happens so slowly. Do you think anyone remembers it? So both Alberta, the really rich small population province in Canada, and Western Australia, the really rich small population state in Australia, switched from being quite for some quite some period beneficiaries to being asked now to hand it back well do you think they remembered having been beneficiaries they have extreme people have extremely short memories in these situations that was yesterday that wasn't me that was my father or my mother or, or whatever but it wasn't me you're robbing me um so it just doesn't work politically that's the problem if it was it occurred more frequently over a shorter period of time across a bigger range then maybe people would see the swings and roundabouts side but it doesn't look like swings and roundabouts to them so i think that that is the political reality so. questions please alan uh, i would like to know more because uh, uh, we have an idea that Australia is a, I would say it's a quite centralized uh, federation. And, and, and why is so important, uh, my question. In Brazil, we have also the federal government having it's a lot of power in order to define so standardism, uh, rules and the like. And we know that in Australia, the federal government also use uh, very well the so-called power of the poor in order to induce states to adhere to federal policies and the like. So I would like to, to ask how, in fact, that the federal government use this power of the poor in order to, uh, to bring together states to implement federal policies and the like. This is my general question. Well, you're quite right, Eduardo, that, that, that the power of the purse, the spending power, is used, is used extensively in Australia and has been a big part of the centralisation of Australian federalism. It's mainly concentrated in the really big national programs, like particularly schooling uh, and health. Um, and over, most importantly, in the mid-80s, it was used to introduce a national <coughs> public health insurance scheme which was a, you know, a revolutionary development by a left-wing party in Australia. Uh, I'm using revolutionary a bit cavalierly there, but it, 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 was, a, it was a big policy change. Um, and so most of, it, it, the bulk of what goes on is in those, is in those areas. But it's also, it, it's, then it's used often on a, in a very whimsical way. So, you know, a politician will be campaigning in a federal election and there'll be a complaint about something in the local neighborhood that has nothing to do with this, with the federal government. But then she will promise that, we, you know, if I elected, I'll fix this. And there'll be a little grant program, you know, promising, you know, $20 million to this particular electorate uh, of federal money if they do some, if they do X. So it's used in a very in in that kind of way, um, but there's still substantial autonomy for the states. And in my impression, I have a question for Marta, which and I'll ask her right now, which is, 
is Brazil a federation? Uh, just yes or no. I don't want any waffling or anything. Just yes or no. <laughs> um, and, and you know, Australia still is very much a federation. The, the states still have so they have autonomy in the way in, on the implementation side of those programs that the that the um, federal government funds uh, and directs through its funding. But also large, and, and this is what both climate change and COVID really showed was that they still have major independent roles in in the political system. And of course, they're much more uh, disconnected constitutionally from the federal government as well. I mean, there would be the idea that there would be simultaneous elections at the state level and the Commonwealth and the federal level would be inconceivable in Australia, that sort of thing. So it, it's, it, it has become much more centralized than it was, but it was a very decentralized system originally as designed. So it still is a genuine federation with genuine autonomy for in many ways for the constituent units. Edward, does that answer your question sufficiently? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I understood. I understood from your presentation that it's hard to put all federations it into boxes. Yeah, yeah. So I would say the same about Brazil. It's hard to 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 to, to put Brazil into into a, a clear box. I would say yes. Yes, for uh, several reasons. Uh, the main reason is that uh, the members of the federation, the states and municipalities, indeed have political rights, as it is the case of in, in federation. So the states and municipalities have the right to representation in central arenas. Uh, they have uh, uh, the right to, to implement their own policy or policies, except in the case that uh, the federal legislature, the federal legislature uh, rules about. So I would say that it, Brazil is a, a quite centralized federation, and I would say more than that, I would say that it's moved toward further centralization this this uh, if this um, uh, consumption tax reform is approved uh, gets eventually approved um, states and municipalities will have uh, their authority to set the rates of their own taxes very very limited and they would have a greater difficulty to let's say control their finances and so on but um, uh, it's the price uh, to pay to have a less crazy fiscal uh, uh, system and it's the price to pay to avoid uh, what is a huge burden on uh, entrepreneurship uh, in Brazil. The, let, let me just uh, give you a figure. The juridical contentions, uh, how can I say that? Um, uh, no. Legal cases, Legal cases uh, discussing the taxes in Brazil is, uh, in, in terms of its amount, it is equal to the Brazilian GDP because enterprises in Brazil spend le more time dealing with the fiscal system than investing and in making so it's it's the price to pay to make to 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 to, to make that the fiscal system contributes to economic growth and all. we have a lot of uh, let's say hopes attached to the approval of this uh, tax reform but the fact is that the states and municipality will have their authority over their own taxes more uh, limited but it's a decision taken in central arenas with the representation of states and municipalities they agreed upon so uh, it's how our federation uh, uh, operates. So, uh, but I, I would say to, to, be, to, to, to be simply that, in spite of that, of, be, of being a quite centralized federation, 
states and municipalities still have in Brazil political rights as members of uh, the federation. This re re uh, regards their representation, their voice in central arenas, and uh, the aut autonomy to implement uh, their own policies, except in cases that the federal legislation rules about with a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just, a, just a second, uh, I'd like to say that we have still six minutes left because uh, when it's quarter to... To noon, well. yes, well. When it's quarter to uh, 12, we will have Daniel Belan uh, online. So, Juan, please. Okay, uh, my name is Juan Olmeda from El Colegio de Mexico. Uh, I have a question for Marta. Uh, you mentioned the, the Supreme Court decisions uh, during the pandemic, and as I understand, they were the result of um, legal claim, claims uh, pushed forward by state governments uh, arguing that the federal government was violating their autonomy. So um, I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that legal dispute and to, I, I would like to also to know uh, if that uh, the use of, of the legal system or the court system is, is common in Brazil for the states to, to claim for, for their autonomy. Yeah, the Supreme Court in Brazil has very broad competencies. And I would say that any loser in the legislative arena presents a claim before the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court is very, very active in the, in the Brazilian uh, politics, not only in the, let's say, federal dimension, but in many other dimensions uh, as well. Um, and it is, it, 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 the Supreme Court turned out to be very, very controversial in Brazil. Uh, because so if you, if you we think on the democratic back backsliding uh, sliding things backsliding um, uh, risk the uh, at, at a certain point or at a certain point uh, last year the Supreme Court was the only body in Brazil that was indeed uh, fighting and uh, let's say impeding uh, Bolsonaro's action. So the Supreme Court is very, very uh, active in Brazil. Regarding this uh, dimension of the pandemic, uh, it was the, on, the, on the 20th of March, Bolsonaro enacted a decree stating that it was exclusive to the federal government to decide on people's mobility. So he was trying to tie the hands of states in municipalities. That in the very beginning of uh, the, the pandemic, nobody, uh, it was very hard to make decisions because the level of, of uh, uncertainty and ignorance was very high, high and state governments and municipalities, state governors and mayors were dealing with people. And so they started trying to put people into their homes and stay there. And Bolsonaro understood that uh, it was a conspiration against him to paralyze the economy and, uh, uh, let's say, impeding him to be uh, to be reelected. So he, he, he interpreted the, inter, interpreted the constitution say from now on it's only up to the presidents to make uh, decisions about that and um, so there is uh, uh, a left-wing party presented a, a, a contestation before the supreme court and the supreme court decided that it states it was a health problem and as health problems are concurrent competences of um, the three levels of government, the states and municipalities could make decisions about. That's 
that's it. So they, they just deny it, defeat it, Bolsonaro's strategy to tie the hands of those that are not allied uh, with uh, him. He, Bolsonaro, interpreted that the court had decided that he was uh, 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 no, that he was forbidden to do anything, which is not true. It was, it was his free interpretation of the political bargain. The court decided states and municipalities can make decisions about uh, this, uh, this issue. And so that's why they were, they turned out to be very uh, active. But it was not a claim of states and municipalities for autonomy. It was, uh, and, the, and the decision was the, the court interpreted what as a health problem, which was, uh, which opened broad uh, opportunities for states and municipalities to make decisions about economic issues, closing uh, shops, closing industry, with its indirectly related to policy, to health policy. So it was a kind of free interpretation, but it was a policy decision against, against uh, concentrating even further authority upon him, which saved many, many lives. But it was a federal issue. Okay, uh, sorry, 15 to 12. I think that we we are going to have Daniel, Daniel Belin. You can open one more question from the, okay. oh, Really? Can, okay. Can go on. Go ahead. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> ah, there we have Daniel Belin. I just appeared, indeed. Okay. <laughs> Can I start now, or you have something else to say before I start? Uh, we were ending second. our uh, Q and A session. Can can we have uh, two minutes, please? Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, it will be a brief question. Uh, I'm Manuel, I'm PhD student here at FGV. Um, my question is: uh, We usually are talking about centralization and centralization centralization in federations. Um, I would ask. How would you point the issue of coordination uh, on this uh, on this line from decentralization to centralization, decentralization to centralization? It is always a matter of more centralization if you have more coordination, or you may have coordination without uh, coercion or forms that centralize power. Half a minute, please. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> is this on still? Yeah. It strikes me you answered your own question that you may have either depending on the actual institutional and political power structures. So coordination in Australia has generally been a mask for centralization, but it, and we'll be hearing more about this later on. Uh, that's not always the case. There, there can be coordination that is much more of a partnership of equals. So that will that will vary from circumstance to circumstance, I think is so it can go either way. I think that's the easy answer. Okay, thank you. So now we will ha we're having uh, Daniel Belin from the McGill University, speaking from Canada, I, I suppose, and uh, he will um, speak about federalism and social policy in times of crisis. The word is yours. Thank you for the patience, Daniel. No worries. Thank you very much. Very interesting discussion. I've been following that, uh, listening on YouTube, and now I transferred to Zoom. <laughs> And I'm really happy to be with you this morning virtually. It's too bad I, I could not make the trip to Sao Paulo. Um, but um, I, I thank the organizers, of course, for their, their invitation. It's a very timely and important topic. Um, today, I will talk about, I will just put my slides here. I will talk about federalism and social policy uh, in times of crisis. Um, and I will argue that emergencies are only uh, likely to uh, have a transformative impact on federalism and social policy when they become uh, a durable crisis. Um, in other words, a temporal approach to federalism and social policy development in times of crisis is necessary. And that approach, as I will show, must take partisanship uh, into account. 
um, so elections and uh, partisan control. Uh, so long-term uh, uh, crisis generate cumulative effects that are much more likely to uh, have a transformative political and policy uh, impact uh, than uh, uh, short-term uh, emergencies. And so that's why the temporal aspect is very important. So far, we have talked a lot about federalism, but not as much about emergencies, how we define emergencies uh, and, and crisis. Here, I will actually focus on economic crisis. Um, they can be recession or even outright depression, as I will um, show uh, later. Uh, this temporal approach uh, to, to crisis and, and uh, policy change, of course, uh, uh, is valid for all countries, not just federal countries. But today I will focus on federal countries, on Canada and the United States. Um, and my emphasis will not be on intergovernmental relations or on fiscal federalism, two issues that have already been mentioned and very important issues. But today I will focus on the impact of major economic crisis on the role of the federal government in social policy. Um, so, of course, it's hard to anticipate whether a crisis will lead to durable change uh, uh, beyond the, the temporary measures enacted uh, towards the beginning of it. So if you uh, look at, um, you know, the Great Depression or the 2008 financial crisis, followed by the Great Recession, and if you look at COVID-19, um, you have, of course, normally at the beginning of this emergency, uh, temporary measures that are adopted often by the federal government, but also uh, by sub-federal units. Um, but the question is to know whether these temporary measures will become permanent, or at least whether the emergency, uh, if it lasts and become a, a major crisis over time, will actually lead to permanent uh, uh, policy change, and perhaps a transformation of um, the federal system uh, towards, for instance, greater centralization, which is often uh, a, a major, um, I would say, factor um, when, when we talk about a major economic crisis. Um, so we need to take a long-term uh, historical and comparative perspective on these crises to understand how over time, and sometimes it's it's not just a matter of days or months, but years and even decades, uh, can major crises actually set into motion policy changes that are likely to affect uh, the federal system and the division of, the division of labor uh, between uh, the federal government and um, sub-federal uh, units. Um, so. When we talk about the, if we take the example of the Great Depression, which really was set into motion um, in the aftermath of the October 1929 uh, Great Depression, uh, the, 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 the crash, the, the financial crash, uh, that led to uh, a very long uh, uh, economic depression. In fact, uh, in North America, the Great Depression only ended really with the, the beginning of the, uh, the Second World War. There were ups and downs. Um, you know, the, the, at some point, the economy will recover, but then uh, never totally uh, uh, returning to normal. And it's only with the entry of um, Canada and then the United States into the Second World War uh, that really economic prosperity returned in a durable manner uh, in both countries. Um, what's interesting is that there was an important lag between uh, the beginning of the crisis and the adoption of transformative policies that in both Canada and the United States will lead to a much greater, a greater centralization of the federal system, a much greater role of the federal government in social policy. Uh, that was especially the case in the United States, uh, and that's related to partisanship. Right. So when the depression uh, hit the country, uh, you had a, a Republican president in the White House uh, and FDR and the Democrats were only only entered the White House uh, uh, and took control of Congress uh, in um, January uh, in early 1933. And it's only after that that the New Deal began. So the New Deal started several years after the beginning of the Great Depression. And it's only in 1935 
uh, 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 that permanent uh, reforms were adopted beyond temporary work, uh, uh, public work pro, uh, uh, programs and so forth, uh, the creation of the first federal social insurance program in 1935, social security, uh, uh, was really a transformative moment uh, in terms of the US federal system and US social policy and led to a much greater direct role of the federal government in social policy. But again, there was almost you know, six years between the beginning of the, 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 the original crash and the beginning of the Great Depression and the enactment of these uh, transformative policies in 1935. In Canada, it took even more time for this to materialize. Uh, and in this case here, uh, there were, um, the federal government enacted a unemployment insurance program in uh, late 1935. But um, in this case, it's the, the Supreme Court and then the Judicial um, uh, Committee of the, the Privy Council Office uh, that was the highest uh, court at the time in Canada that was actually based in London, that basically stroked down this legislation. And so the court said, no, the federal government cannot enact a, a federal unemployment insurance program unilaterally. And so Ottawa has to uh, bargain with the provinces uh, and get them to agree uh, to the creation of this federal unemployment insurance program, something that only occurred once the Second World War had begun in 1940. And, and the war here played a major role in terms of consolidating the centralization of, uh, um, of social policy, not full centralization, but in Canada, the centralization of unemployment insurance, and the United States, the centralization of old age insurance. Um, and so there was a second crisis in a way, not an economic crisis. On the opposite, the war created economic prosperity, but there was a national security crisis. Um, and that reinforced, of course, centralization uh, um, in both countries in terms of increasing the fiscal capacity of the federal government. Uh, after the war, however, in Canada, there will be a pushback against this, this centralization of the fiscal uh, system. Um, and and so we will talk here only about the partial centralization of, of, of social policy. Uh, and the same thing in the United States, because states still to this day uh, play a major role in social policy. Um, now, if we move from the Great Depression to the Great Recession, and we talk about what happened in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis in Canada and the United States, uh, we saw that temporary measures were enacted in both uh, um, countries. But of course, this uh, the Great Recessions. The Great Recession was shorter, much shorter than the Great uh, Depression, and um, and the temporary measures enacted, um, say in two thousand nine, two thousand and ten, most of them uh, uh, did not last. Um, but there were some indirect effects of the Great Recession on the policy agenda and on the debate over uh, increasing the role of the federal government in social policy in both the United States uh, and Canada. Uh, so clearly, when we talk about the United States, um, the debate on uh, what will become Obamacare was actually already raging before uh, the, the, the financial crisis of the fall of 2008. But this financial crisis took place, was triggered in the middle of the presidential campaign. Um, and after uh, the election of Barack Obama, uh, the, the Great Recession was used as a way to justify the enactment of Obamacare uh, because uh, a lot of people lost their uh, private insurance coverage during uh, the Great Recession, so in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And so um, the, 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 the Democrats used this this, um, this situation, right, the negative consequence of the Great Recession on uh, health insurance coverage to justify Obamacare. Now, it's possible that Ob Obamacare would have been enacted without uh, uh, this uh, um, Great Recession, uh, but certainly um, there, there is a sense that Democrats use it to justify uh, their, their policy agenda. Now, in Canada, uh, the Great Recession <clears throat> actually led to a major debate over the potential expansion of the Canada Pension Plan, uh, which is run by the federal government, but in which the, the provinces uh, have a veto point in terms of reform. 
So it's a federal program, but uh, in which you have uh, really intergovernmental relations built in, in the sense that the federal government cannot reform that program uh, without having support of at least uh, uh, two thirds of the provinces representing at least two thirds of the population. Um, and what happened at the time, of course, in the aftermath of the, the, the financial crisis, people lost a lot of their savings, they had to postpone retirement and uh, in terms of because of their private benefits, and that increased the legitimacy of the idea of increasing the size of public pensions, including the Canada pension plan. And there was a, you know, this was debated for years. The NDP, so the New Democratic Party, the left-wing party, Social Democratic Party, really put that at the center of its agenda. And finally, in 2015, the liberals uh, put that also uh, on their electoral agenda, on their platform. Um, um, and the, the expansion of the Canada Pension Plan really occurred only in 2016 after the liberals uh, took office. Because when the crisis hit the country, it was the conservatives under Stephen Harper who were in power, and they, in the end, refused to uh, talk to the provinces to expand the Canada pension plan. And so this expansion only took place much later. But the Great Recession set this debate and, and this agenda setting process uh, into motion. Uh, and so it had an indirect effect here on the expansion of uh, the Canada pension plan. Um, there were also um, other effects, long-term effects of the Great uh, Recession, but again, they are quite uh, uh, indirect uh, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, um, agenda setting for, for child benefits and so forth. Uh, if we look at um, COVID-19, so the other crisis I wanted to talk about today, um, in both countries, we had temporary uh, uh, measures economic measures that were enacted uh, in the aftermath of what was probably the, the, the most dramatic economic emergency we ever experienced. Uh, um, so even more dramatic than the, 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 the financial crash of uh, uh, October 1929 or the, the financial crisis of the fall of 2008, uh, the unemployment rate really increased dramatically in late March, early April 2020 in the aftermath of um, all these public health measures that really hit the economy in a major way. Um, and this sudden economic crisis led the federal government in both countries to enact massive uh, uh, yet temporary programs to uh, really, this was a form of uh, crisis, what we call crisis Keynesianism. So really deficit spending on a large scale to really send checks to people, send money to people uh, who had lost uh, income or even people in general so that they keep consuming and that the, that, that the economy stays afloat and that people also have some money uh, uh, to really uh, cope with this very difficult and unusual uh, economic situation. At the same time, the, if we talk about social policy per se, the welfare state, not public health, but more uh, income programs and so forth, income support programs, uh, the economic downturn uh, was short-lived. Uh, the economy started to recover even in mid-late 2020. Uh, and as a consequence, many but the temporary measures that were really large measures that were enacted to support families and, and the unemployed and, and people who had lost income during the, 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 the beginning of the pandemic, these measures were lifted. They were dismantled over time. Um, now, uh, in Canada, there were some, you can say, indirect effects in terms of fostering a coalition, uh, uh, an, an, an electoral alliance between the NDP and the Liberals that helped, uh, you know, uh, foster the development of, of a, a federal childcare uh, uh, framework and more spending in childcare. In the U.S., there was an attempt to make temporary child benefits permanent. Um, uh, after Joe Biden became president, but this, uh, this effort actually failed. So overall, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on social policy in terms of permanent uh, uh, effects uh, um, has been limited so far, but it's still actually early in the game uh, to understand the long-term effect of this, um, uh, of this crisis. Because again, when we talk about, um, you know, there can be indirect effects that take quite a bit of time 
uh, to materialize. But if you look at Canada and the United States, these three crises, so the Great Depression, the Great Recession, and the recent COVID-19 crisis, they all increase the role of the federal government um, in a way. Um, but this was much more the case when we talk about the Great Depression, which lasted much more time, right? It was a very long crisis. Um, and uh, also when we talk about recent crises, um, especially the COVID-19 crisis, they were shorter. And also uh, the effect on uh, was more temporary than permanent. Although in Canada, we saw um, the, um, the expansion of the Canada pension plan, but that became possible only because of a major partisan realignment when the conservatives of Stephen Harper were defeated by the liberals of Justin Trudeau uh, in the fall of 2015. Um, and that was, you know, uh, uh, six years after uh, the, 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 the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, so um, uh, that's really important to understand the, the time frame here and uh, the need to take a longer uh, term uh, look at uh, crisis and how they might impact uh, centralization within federal uh, systems in the field of social policy. And uh, we can certainly um, understand, also stress the importance of partisanship. So it's not just about the crisis, it's length and its scope. It's also about what political parties do, who's in power at the federal level, but also who's in power at the sub-federal level. Something I didn't talk about uh, because my time is limited, but certainly uh, we've seen these changes in Canada and they affected um, uh, the politics of the reform of the Canada pension plan. Um, and so uh, certainly uh, crises do matter. They are really uh, uh, central in terms of the politics of uh, federalism. They do affect uh, the ways in which uh, um, uh, really uh, political parties uh, interact in the context of the federal system, they do tend to uh, uh, favor at least a short-term push for centralization through emergency measures, because the federal government, of course, has more fiscal capacity. It varies, of course, from country to country. Uh, some countries, the federal government has more fiscal capacity than in others compared to uh, sub-federal units. Uh, but what is clear when we look at Canada and the United States, uh, certainly uh, crises in and of them, themselves uh, um, matter, but their impact is mediated by the time frame, right? The temporal aspect of these uh, crises, but also it's mediated by partisanship and who's in, in power when the crisis hits. And also it's about future elections and future electoral realignment. Uh, uh, some, sometimes years after the crisis hit the country, that can uh, lead to changes that were, um, um, in a way, uh, uh, set into motion, at least partly, by the crisis itself. So you need to have a kind of fine-grained process tracing approach and really recognize the importance of the time frame when you study policy change in federal systems. You have to understand that if you look at the impact of the pandemic just over six months, a year or two years, you might miss, you might miss things that will unfold uh, uh, over time, over uh, uh, a longer period. Um, so the time frame is important for uh, the analysis itself. Um, and we need a longer time frame to understand the impact of crisis on the federal system. Here I focus mainly on the issue of centralization and the role of the federal government. But I will argue that this is the same thing when we talk about fiscal federalism and when we talk about intergovernmental relations. So don't just look, and, and of course, many people, when the pandemic hit, we started to publish about COVID-19 and Alan and I with some other people who have published about this and, and, and people in this room, I'm sure, and Sao Paulo as well and other people online have published about the impact of COVID-19 on federalism uh, and public policy. But the truth of the matter is that the story in a way is still going on. Uh, because some of the effects might not be entirely perceptible or some of the effects might be delayed by, um, you know, the lack of partisan realignment. But if these realignments take place over time, uh, the, the, the crisis itself may still bear some fruit that are the fruit that are still not uh, uh, clearly visible to the observer. So I will end here so that we have more time for discussion.
Uh, and I, of course, welcome uh, your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Daniel, for this insightful uh, speech. I'll take some questions from uh, the floor. Uh, 15 minutes. We have 15 minutes to this Q&A session. Thank you, Professor Bella, for you repeating the words from my colleague Rogério, insightful speech. And I was wondering if, in the case of Canada or even the United States, you talk about the, this dimension of IGR. But my, my point is, in the case of Canada, we know that the Council of Federations, I, I'm not sure, this, the Council uh, gathering this pro, uh, pro, provincial prime minister uh, performances of very relevant role in terms of to, de to defend the autonomy of the province. And also in the United States, we have some uh, association of, of national or state governments, I'm not remember the, uh, rightly the name, sorry. But my point is, uh, it's possible to say that comparing these both federations, the role of these associations could have uh, a relevant role in order to, uh, to, to, um, to uh, to perform in terms of intergovernmental lobby in order to protect autonomy, considering these uh, external effects uh, acting over over the way how the, the, the federal design can work. Yeah, you know, yes, but in Canada, if you look at the situation during the pandemic, the <laughs> what, what the uh, provinces have done working together. Um, in this forum that you mentioned, is that they actually lobbied the federal government for more healthcare money. <laughs> so uh, they, that's the the you know they have the, and of course there was a lot of coordination during the pandemic between the federal government and the provinces, uh, and things were smoother in Canada than the United States, obviously because in the United States you had Trump, so quite a few similarities with Brazil with Bolsonaro be, being the president at the time, um, but. I would say that um, there was a lot of intergovernmental consultation and, and dialogue, but there was also a lot of pressure uh, on the part of provinces for the federal government to do more in terms of vaccine procurement, right? Uh, and the federal government pl did play that role, right? In terms of vaccination, that's not something I talk about today because it's not about the welfare state in the narrow sense of the term, but. Uh, it's the federal government that basically took over procurement and the provinces and territories will actually be in charge of the vaccination campaigns on the ground. So there was a very, you know, um, very kind of strict division of labor here. Uh, and the provinces, didn't, there were some attempts, provinces at some point became impatient and some premiers said, oh, maybe we should take, you know, maybe we should buy our own, you know, vaccines and so forth. But so overall, it, it actually uh, worked quite well. But, um, you know, during the, 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 the pandemic, uh, there was still a lot of reliance when there is this big economic emergency. When we talk about cash uh, benefits, when we talk about sending checks to people, the federal government played the biggest role by far. The provinces could have, you know, uh, uh, do more in that. They could have done way more in that regard, but they were very happy to look at the federal government spending enormous amount of money, like the biggest deficit ever, right? Doing this kind of crisis Keynesianism, playing that game. And the provinces were happy uh, to, to let the federal government do that. Um, and they benefited from this indirectly, right? But this was meant to be temporary. And in, in the end, it was in terms of these, uh, these cash programs. Um, and, and so I think that it depends what area of, of social policy you look at. If you look at public health, uh, or you look at uh, you know vaccination campaigns, or you look at cash benefits, certainly in terms of cash benefits, what I've studied is that you know in the U.S. and in Canada, states and provinces were very happy to see a, a more direct role of the the federal government for a limited period of time. And overall, this is this is what happened during the pandemic. Long answer, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Marta asked it before. 
then I'll take yours, Alex. So very, very briefly, thanks, Professor Bellen, for your presentation. I was just wondering, wondering if your your conclusions are not affected by the selection, your selection of cases. I mean, um, Vito points to the expansion of social protection protection in in Canada and United States are very strong, and we cannot expect them to disappear in case of emer emergencies. But uh, my question is uh, whether. It, the story would be different in cases where the expansion or, of uh, social policies is very, very popular and veto points are uh, less extensive as the, the United States and Canada cases are. I mean, uh, uh, the, the Brazil uh, has made a big leap to, toward the expansion of uh, what we call Bolsa Familia, and it, it turned out to be to be uh, permanent because it uh, ended up being part of a big, big competitive electoral game. So my point is, is the selection of thesis maybe affecting your, your conclusions? Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm really talking here about Canada and the United States. It might, it might be different in other countries. Now talking about veto points and in Canada, when you talk about cash benefits, it depends on there were veto points, like in the case of the courts in the 1930s, uh, because of you know constitutional matters, um, and, and that's true. Uh, also, you have partisan uh, veto points to a certain extent, but as I explained, when you have a partisan realignment, uh, things change. So when the, the 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 liberals took power with the majority government in 2015, um, um, you know they they were able to uh, to do a lot in terms of social policy expansion. Um, and also there was a realignment at the provincial level, uh, the victory of the NDP, the, the Social Democratic Party in Alberta, that changed the intergovernmental relations and allowed the federal government to strike a deal with the provinces to expand the Canada pension plan. So even in Canada, with, with these veto points that you mentioned, uh, a change became possible, but only over a relatively uh, long period of time. Now, in the case of Brazil, um, you have to also look at you know, uh, uh, take a long-term perspective um, and, and, and look at what will happen over the next uh, few years uh, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, cash benefits, uh, cash transfers, and, you know, obviously <laughs> things didn't go well under Bolsonaro, but, you know, there is uh, a debate over, you know, more social policy expansion, so I don't know all the, the details of it, but yes, of course, uh, this is just a story about Canada and the United States. And if I will do the same study and I will include other countries, say Brazil and Argentina or uh, uh, European countries, then I might reach uh, different uh, conclusions. Yes, Jean. Yes. Thank you, Dani Daniel, for your speech. Thank you. In terms of your explanation, uh, what are your recommendations uh, in terms of the new crisis for federalis federalism countries? Yes, I think that... It's a big um, question, but... <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, thank you very much. You know, of course, it depends on the, on the country. Um, certainly, um, we have to, in, in terms of, so if you talk about policy recommendations, um, I think it's important to understand that... Um, there is all when you have a major crisis like this, you know, you sometimes have to compromise. And, you know, even if, you know, you're not so sympathetic to having a central role of the federal government uh, or you, you, you support more decentralization, sometimes you have to put some wine, uh, some water into your wine. As we say in French, you have to compromise. Um, and under some circumstances, these changes will be temporary, but there's always the risk that uh, this could, if the crisis lingers, right, that uh, these temporary measures might pave the way to permanent measures that will make centralization itself permanent. So, um, and that is uh, uh, certainly um, uh, something that people have to take in mind, uh, have to take into account uh, when they, um, they they address such a major crisis. But you know, when there was this um, COVID-19, when it hit Canada, for example, 
uh, in, and, and we had the public health measures, strong restrictions enacted in, in uh, mid late March, uh, early April uh, 2020. Um, the economy really collapsed. And at the time, you know, there was for a short period of time, the provinces and the federal government uh, uh, got together and they were able to work together in part because there was a relative alignment between the, the partisan control at the federal level and in the provinces. But over time, this, uh, uh, um, this uh, it, at least in some provinces, but there was also, I think, compromise on the part of conservative premiers who again adopted a more moderate approach and stopped criticizing the federal government uh, uh, at least for a few months compared to what they were doing before the beginning of the pandemic. And so there was a short period of time where there was real collaboration and there was a synergy really in terms of uh, uh, working together to address this crisis. But a lesson of this is of course that it didn't last long. So even if you have a, a, a dynamic where there is more collaboration as opposed to what happened say in the US where Donald Trump took on you know, democratic governors in a direct way, or, or, of course, in Brazil with Bolsonaro, also fighting with some mayors and some governors. Um, you know, even if Canada it was much more peaceful in terms of intergovernmental relations at the beginning of the crisis, did this did not last <laughs> very long. Um, and, and so I think that's also important to have a tempor temporal perspective on intergovernmental relations. When you really hit in the face by something dramatic, I think um, if the, the federal government is willing to cooperate uh, uh, with uh, the sub-federal units. Uh, I think there is possibility of some, um, some collaboration, uh, stronger than usual, but it's unlikely to last very long. Okay, another question. Yeah, Norbert Kessig from Münster University in Germany. I mean, what you're mentioning is uh, the, uh, there is a process of a rally around the flag um, yes. strategy when it comes to the to, to a crisis and of course I think the crisis of course economic crisis is a little bit different to a pandemic of course mm -hmm. but um, when you have a what you said is when you have a right-wing populist party in government and which is more denial or not not a scientific party how mm -hmm. Marta called it uh, uh, it is of course a different situation and the question is, as I understood you now in the last answer it, that that makes a big difference between Canada and the United States right is that but, but was yes. it the same was it the same for the economic crisis a great recession a great repression depression yes yes and no i mean there, there were some differences um in terms of i think it's true so when the the, the great the, the financial crisis hit the us it was still uh, george w bush who was in power and he enacted some some really uh measures um emergency measures but of course the Democrats, once they were in power, they did more than what uh, W. Bush would have done if he had stayed in power, or if the, the, his successor, Republican successor, would have done. So I think partisanship still matters, even when we talk about an economic crisis. Um, because um, in Canada, for example, you know, the, the conservatives under Stephen Harper, they were really reluctant in 2008, 2009, to adopt uh, a major uh, measures, even temporary measures to rescue the economy, but they were pressured by opposition parties and, and, and other actors to really act, right? While the liberals uh, during the COVID-19 economic crisis, they were really, they like big government, right? Uh, they believe in a strong role of the federal government. So they were not really shy to push for uh, big, bold spending, right? So I think there, there are some differences, even in the case of an economic crisis. But when we talk about the pandemic, I think the, 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 the I would say the partisan differences are even greater, especially when we talk about, you know, far right populist party versus any other party. It could be a center right or a center left uh, a government. Uh, when it's the, the right wing populism, I, th I think that in the case of the pandemic, that led to, I think, uh, major problems in terms of intergovernmental relations and also really um, bad policy on the part of the federal government. And that's the case both in Brazil and the United States. Please. Hello, Daniel. Um, 
Thank you so much. Here's Jared, Jared Sonnigsen from EWTH Aachen University in, in Germany. Thank you so much for your, your enlightening talk. And I, I have a question about crisis and change. I'm a little afraid to ask it because I've read so much of what you've done, so I should probably know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, I wonder, um, from your perspective, you hinted at this about durable changes. Do we, can we expect more durable changes during a crisis and crisis responses? Or from your perspective, are they more things that happen in the shadow or in the wake after the mm -hmm. crisis when learning effects can take in and the temporary measures are either thrown away or transformed into more long-term changes? Thank you. Yes, no, thank you for your, your question and kind words. Look. Um, in many cases, it takes a while when you talk about permanent measures. So the reflex is to adopt temporary measures. Often you improvise or you have sometimes even automatic uh, measures that take place on a temporary basis. Um, and, and, and I think it takes time often to, uh, to see whether you will have transformative change or not that, that comes out of it. Um, and, and so, um, you know, in Canada, we designed an entirely new program, uh, CERB, the Canada Emergency uh, uh, Response Benefit. And this program was enormous, was massive, but was designed in like a week. But it was also deeply flawed. <laughs> and it was dismantled um, um, after nine months or 10 months, right? Um, so it takes time to design and um, implement a transformative permanent policies. And so that's why I think we have to take kind of have a long-term frame in, in mind when we study this. And I, what I'm saying too is that the impact of the pandemic, at least the indirect impact, uh, is still lingering. It's still not over in a way. Uh, even if we think that the, yes, the, 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 the public health crisis might be over, uh, but it's a political impact, it's policy impact uh, might last for still years to come. And we have to, it might just be in the background, it might not be obvious, but um, it might be activated by, you know, electoral change or by other uh, changes um, in, in the political system. And, and that's why I say that, you know, um, uh, we have to understand, take a long term view on, on, on crisis um, and, and not stop studying them after they are, they are just after they end, officially end. And we say, oh, now we, we don't no, no longer have this public health emergency. Let's move on. Let's not study COVID-19 anymore and what happened. Of course, we need to continue to study them because uh, their impact can, can materialize over years and sometimes even over decades after they are over. Alan, please. Daniel, Alan Fenner here. Um, just for the sake of discussion, may I be so bold as to suggest that your intertemporal comparison is fundamentally misleading? Yeah. Uh, the changes that occurred mid-century in Canada, Australia, and the United States were transformations of the federal systems that were one-off. It's like growing up. You can yes. only go through puberty once. Yes. Right? So things will happen to you later on. That's right. But that fundamental transformation of maturation from a 19th century to a 20th century federation, yes. that can't be reproduced. So the notion of comparing what happens now with then is fundamentally misleading. Well, look, it's not misleading, but yeah, I acknowledge that. Uh, certainly that, you know, when people talk about the, the New Deal in the US, they talk about the Big Bang, right? Uh, something that was uh, quite dramatic. But in fact, when you look at the, the development of social policy in the US and in Canada, it was quite incremental. Um, it, it took place over a long period of time in terms of the development of, of you know, the modern welfare state in Canada. It took place from the 1930s to the 19, uh, uh, mid, mid, late 1960s, early 1970s. But you're right. I mean, if you want to, and I have, when I write about that, I, I'm, I didn't mention that today, I didn't have time, but there is a difference when we talk about social policy, you know, and Paul Pearson has written a lot about this uh, between uh, what he calls the, the politics of expansion or the welfare state development, and then the politics of what they call permanent austerity or the politics of retrenchment. But I've, as I've shown recently, an article with Kent Weaver and Michael Prince published in the Canyon Journal of Political Science. I think that the distinction between the two uh, um, is we should not overstate it, 
Uh, we've seen in Canada, for example, in, in recent, I would say over the last decade, major changes to our social programming in terms of childcare, in terms of uh, child benefits, really transformative uh, changes. So I think that we cannot say that, you know, there was, the, yeah, there was this era of expansion. Uh, and, and then it's true in North America, it, it, it really stopped and even there was retrenchment and, and so forth. But we have seen, uh, and with Obamacare in the US, new forms of welfare state expansion. So yes, it's different than, uh, of course, what happened in the 1930s, 40s, uh, when, you know, there was very little in terms of federal social policy and suddenly uh, uh, it became a big thing. So, and that's something I've emphasized in my written work, the importance of, you know, policy legacies and how, you know, new policies build on existing policies. And it's the same thing, of course, when we compare the New Deal with, you know, what's happening during the pandemic or even 2008. Uh, and that I've mentioned that in my work, of course, written work is that uh, uh, there is difference between studying the emergence of the welfare state and then studying you know, changes to an existing welfare state. And that's central to the what I've written on when I write about policy feedback and about, you know, policy legacy. So I think as long as you recognize that, that, you know, what Pearson has written about, that the policies build on existing policies, you can still compare uh, uh, different eras, but uh, you have to understand that, um, uh, that, that each new era is shaped by what happened before it. So you're, you're studying them in relationship to one another and not as things that are com completely discrete, uh, uh, that are completely separated from one another, which I didn't really do today because I don't have time. Uh, but you're absolutely right that you need to take into account the context and the context has changed. And what has changed is that in the 1930s or in 1929, when the Great Depression started, there was no federal welfare state in Canada and the United States. But when you look at 2008 and 2020, then of course it's a different context because we have the, the modern welfare state. Uh, but this welfare state is still changing um, in major ways and not just in the sense of retrenchment and permanent austerity as Pearson argued. So I think that I want to nuance a bit what you said. Um, but yes, the, the historical context is important. Um, and you have to understand that what's happening today is also part of the long-term legacies of what happened during 1930s, 40s, and, and so forth. Um, I think that we have time to take just a, one more question. Okay, there isn't a question. So, Professor Daniel, thanks very much. And in the name of the public here at Fundação Getúlio Vargas. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Um, we're finishing the morning session and we'll be back at um, 1.30 p.m. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>